There's something called the me monster. The me monster is when everything takes place, the first thing that we think about is me. Wherever we go, whatever we do, the me monster comes out. And when the me monster comes out, it becomes selfish because we look at every situation and everything through my lens. Instead of what God would want, we look at what I want. And in the church, the myth that we're going to talk about is the church is all about me. I have to like everything or I'm not going to like anything. And if we ever get to the point that everything that I do, everything that I have has to be about me and what I like, we are going to be miserable because not everybody else thinks about you. Nobody agrees with you on every point. So the me monster can control you and it can control your relationships. And the Bible is very clear about if we always think about me or my desires and not the desires of others, then we are going to be miserable. We're not going to be happy. We're not going to have the friends that we need to have. And the church will never be the church it needs to be. Because the church is not about you. The church is about who? Jesus. And if we don't have Jesus as the priority of our church, we become the club to try to keep people happy, and you can't keep people happy. I agree. You can't do it. The only person that we can keep happy is when we have a right relationship with Christ. Christ is honored and exalted. Um, many years ago, about 25 years ago, I was 30 years old. And uh, I came, <laughs> something like that. Uh, I, went, uh, I went from this little country church that... I had a blind pastor, and we, it was just a country church, a town of maybe 600 people in the town. It was Count Aubrey, Aubrey, Texas, and it was, it was just a small country church. And the Lord moved me from that church as a youth pastor into a church that, listen to this, they had this old facility, and the hospital in Springfield needed that land. So they told the church, you, we, if you will sell us this land, what we're going to do is we have 10 acres out on the highway and we will build you any building that you want completely free and we will buy your building. So I walked into this seven, ready for this, million dollar brand new church. Big time. I was this little country youth pastor. And I was exalted into this administrative pastor position with seven or eight hundred people in the seven million dollar complex with two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the bank. And I didn't know anything about administration. And the pastor said, Bruce, what we need to do is, is we need to start doing some things to the facilities. And the youth pastor came up and said, we need to, we need to buy a couple vans. So my very first month as the administrative pastor in this big, rich church. And I am a country bumpkin. I didn't know Jack. And I had to walk into this deacon board meeting with 12 old, old men like Ken White. Where's Ken White? I mean, they're all like Ken White. A bunch of old, white-haired old men. And they are all sitting around this table. And I had to walk up and I said, guys, uh, my name's Bruce and, and uh, I'm the new administrative pastor here. And they we greeted a little bit, and he said, I have some things I need to talk to you about. We need to buy two vans. Uh, the youth pastor wants a van so we can pick up some kids and do some activities. Here's the me monster that popped out. The chairman of the deacon board sat at the end of the table, put his hands like this, and he said, Son, let me tell you something. I've been here a lot longer than you will ever be here, and this is my church Nothing happens in this church until I agree with it. So we are not going to get your vans. 30 years <laughs> my first deacon board meeting. I said, wow. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought we were here to reach people, not to keep money. 
like that and said, son, that's how we have money, is we don't spend it. Okay. So I, I left with tail between my legs. Okay, don't get a van. We can't fix anything. We got a nice facility. And the church is going downhill. When they were in their old facility, they were doing good. But somehow when they got this $7 million beautiful complex with money in the bank, they folded their arms and they said, I am happy with what I have. I didn't stay at that church very long. I left that church to come here. And when I came here, the same deacon board, except for they're a lot younger here, <laughs> and they said this, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Total different mindset about being arrived, having everything that we want, to be in an old facility over there, just happy to have people coming through the doors and loving people. What do we need to do? The mindset of the me monster at that church is quite different than the loving monster that was in this church to help people and to encourage. When that man folded his arms and said, this is my church, I knew it was not going to be my church. I learned a lot, but I was never happy. I was never happy because of the me mindset. I love the us mindset. And that's what we need to continue in this church. How can we always keep our eyes off of myself and put our eyes on God and never cross our arms and say, we don't want the teens to do that or we don't like the music here or the preacher's too long or whatever the case is. We're not going to be happy about everything, but in everything we can bring glory and honor to Christ. And if we can continue that, then God will continue to bless our church. But let's talk about a few things. First, some scriptures. I want to read a few and, and talk about the, the mindset of the church not being about me, the church always being about him, and he is the vehicle in which we use to reach people for Christ. I understand whenever you're looking for a church, you move a church or you move into town or something happens, there's always that mindset of you have to look or church shop if you would. Because once you find the church, once you agree with the church doctrinally and philosophically and, and in ministry and in style, you, the looking part is not about you anymore. It is what can I do to reach people for Christ? What can I do to minister in the body of Christ? It's the me monster that controls us. And the me monster sometimes hurts us. I'm going to read a few scriptures in the really good. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not be pleasing to ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading them to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. He didn't come to please himself. He came to please and honor others. 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Philippians 2, 4. Let each of you look not only for your own interest, but also the interest of others. In Galatians chapter 6. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each man examine his own work, and then he will rejoicing in himself alone, but not in another. For each one shall bear his and other's load. When we look at others' needs, what happens is we start looking not at the me monster, but we get to look through the lens of helping. And if the church ever loses the sight of helping others, loving others, and encouraging others, we, the body of Christ, become the me monster. And you know the philosophy of the world to the church is the church is all about themselves. The church is full of themselves. The church thinks that they are better than anybody else. We, we look down at other people. What we have to do is we have to change that whole philosophy of the me monster and look at somebody and say, they need us. Not because we are better than them, but because we represent Christ. And none of us are good. None of us. If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, we would be in need. But the me monster sometimes supersedes what I desire. And when somebody walks through the door, when somebody calls you, when somebody's struggling, we can't be the me monster. 
what we have to do is we have to say, what can I do? Whether it's sacrificial, or whether it's time, or whether it's a phone call, I may have something else to do, but that's not what God has asked me to do. We have to sacrifice is what I want, what God wants, or is God teaching me and telling me some things? One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is found in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And it says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live by, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I no longer live for myself. I live for Christ who died for me. Everything I do, it should be. What can I do to represent Christ? We live in this me society. And everybody wants to say, what can it get from me? And what can I get? But it's a myth. There's, there's some things that we have to think about and talk about as far as how to get away from that. Um, the first, uh, when my oldest son was, was born... I, I, I was watching him grow up, and we babied him a lot, and he needed to be babied, you know, he pampered him, and, and, uh, and, but I was longing to hear his first words. And you know, when you have par parents, you, you hear, what's his first word? And you know what I thought his first words were going to be? Daddy. Leslie thought it was going to be mommy, but I thought it was going to be daddy. And you know what it was? Mine. <laughs> his first word, mine. And it hasn't changed yet. <laughs> He's still here, so I can say that. Mine. You know, sometimes we grow up, we think about mine, my toy, my life, what I want. And I think we should have aspirations for positive life, but we can't be caught in the me monster. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says this, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires... They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their eyes away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardships. Do the work of an evangelist. Discourage or discharge all the duties of the ministry. Sometimes we, we, when we don't like something, we're going to hold on to something that we like. Words that we like. Not so, sound doctrine. Not the truth, because the truth may convict me. In 1 Timothy, it says this. If you point these things out to the brothers, you'll be a good minister of Christ, brought up in the truth for the faith of the good teachings that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself up to be godly. For physical training is some, has some value, but godliness has the value for all things holding promise to both the present life and the life to come. Sometimes we hold on to truth that we like, and we discard the truth that we don't. Sometimes we just have to say, what is right? What is right, whether I agree with it or not, and then I have to change my mindset. Barna said this about churchgoers. More than two of five believe that Jesus committed sin while he was on earth committed sin. You know, when God said that J Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, this is the, the perfect Lamb of God. As a church, I would say to you, we have to understand that Jesus was the perfect. He never committed sin. And we died on the cross. He shed his innocent blood for us. And we have to hold on to that as a church. 57% believe that Satan is not a real being and just a symbol of evil. Well, that's exactly what Satan wants you to believe. He wants you to believe one of two different things. Satan wants you to believe that he is all-powerful. He wants you to believe that you cannot sustain against him. He wants you to believe whenever you look at him that he has total control over everything that you do and you have no power over him. Or he wants you to take this side over here that he's a, a goofy cartoon character with a pitchfork in his hands and all he is is make-believe. He doesn't care which end you believe as long as you don't know the truth. And the truth is, it's not about you. The truth is, Satan and Jesus are at war. Jesus wants you to go to heaven with him. He died on the cross for you. 
And it's a myth to believe that Satan wants you. Satan wants to defeat you because Jesus loves you. And it's not about you. It's about Jesus. And what our job is, is to preach the gospel, to share our life to people that Satan wants to destroy. He's not all powerful. Jesus is. He's not a cartoon character at all. He's real. He wants to get into your life. He wants to trip you up. He wants to make your life miserable. But once you give your life to Christ, you have all authority to stand against Satan. Hear that again. You have all authority to stand against Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus has already defeated him. We are a child of God. It's all about Jesus. If it's about you, Satan will destroy you. Satan loves selfish people. Jesus loves humility. If the church is full of selfish individuals, who's in charge of the church? If the church is full of humble people, who's in charge of the church? If we allow the me monster to control us, Satan is in control. But Jesus died for the church. He died for you. And once we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we do not have to believe the myths. Satan is real, but Satan is not all-powerful. Jesus is real, and Jesus has never sinned, and Jesus has all power, all power to do whatever he desires. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. When we look at what Jesus can do and what Jesus wants to do, we have to look at the body of Christ. You know, selfishness works in all areas. Even when we're trying to do good, sometimes selfishness takes over. Even in the church, even in your own personal life. I heard a rumor one time that people actually go to church because they like the music, they like the message, and they like the fellowship. And they join a church because the music, the message, and the fellowship. The purpose of that is the music the message and the fellowship is important. As long as the music, the message, and the fellowship points to Jesus. There's a lot of churches that have good music, have a good message, and have good fellowship, but they don't talk about Jesus. So in everything that we do, in every action that we perform, it has to be about Jesus. Now, Paul was speaking to a lot of individuals, and there was some issues going on that, about the deity of Christ. And Paul in Colossians tried to straighten out to the church about deity, about who God is, who Jesus is, and how Jesus is the creator of everything. And these few verses in Colossians brings the gospel to a head to a point that we absolutely know who Jesus is because Colossians 1 16 through 18. Two verses, or three verses that are absolutely phenomenal. Listen to them. For by him, as Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That's a big one. They were created by him and for him. And he is above all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Wow. That verse, Jesus is the head of the church. Nothing should be done in the church that does not bring glory and honor to Christ. Period. He is the head. He is the head of the body. The body is the body of Christ. He is the church. He's the beginning. He is the love of our life. When you think about your body, you think about how complex our body is. And it is very complex. Whether it's muscles, whether it's tendons, whether it's, whether it's blood, whether you look at all kinds of different things, you can take one inch of your hand and, and diagram that one inch. You have blood vessels. You have pain sensors. You have nerve endings. You have heat sensors. You have pressure sensors. You have all kinds of things within your body. It's very complex. 
And the same way that our body is complex personally, the church is complex. The church has different functions for everything that we do. And as long as your body understands your head is important, your brain is important, your heart is important, but your, your blood vessels are important, your fingers are important, you lost a, a finger, you lost a foot, it would be very difficult. If you ever broke something and you're walking around in a cast, it changes everything that you do. It changes every action that you perform. Try to tie your shoe when your hand's in a cast. It's hard to do. Try to do anything. It's very difficult. So what is the church? The church is a visible proof of the body of Christ. I can't see your spirit, nor you can see mine. But our bodies are alike. They're both visible. A living body is the evidence of a living spirit. The world cannot see the invisible Christ, but it can see the body of Christ. The body of Christ is Jesus in the flesh. We are the hands and the feet of Christ. It can see us. It listens to us. Do we represent Christ? Are we Christ-like ones? They don't see Christ, but Jesus is the head of the church. We are Christ's. We are his hands. We are his feet. So when we look at that and the world looks at us, we are a reflection of Christ. Are we a positive reflection of Christ? Are we a selfish reflection of ourself? So all of body parts make up as a whole. Each part of the body has a purpose. Eyes for seeing. The ears have for hearing, the hand for gripping, and the feet for walking. Each is connected to one another, and it's all connected to the head. As the head controls the body, so Christ ought to control the church. If Christ is the head, it should control every part of the body. It controls what you do, what you say, the actions that you perform. It is a controlling factor. And how we can control our head, our heart, our hands and our feet is if we are connected to the body or we're connected to the head. Each part is dependent upon the head. Each part of the body, each part of our life is dependent upon the head and that's the body of Christ. And that's Jesus Christ, the head of the church. So if we are connected to the head, but we are not doing what Christ asked us to do, we are not abiding, we're not listening. So it doesn't do any good to come to church Listen, you don't hear that from a pastor. It doesn't do us any good to come to church if it's all about you. It does you everything to come to church if we're trying to do it all about him. Because what good is it if the hand says, I don't care what the head wants me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. The hand will never do what it can do unless the brain tells it what to do. Because the brain organizes every muscle. The hand in itself has no control until it's connected to the brain. You ask somebody that had a stroke. And it's, it's hard to watch somebody go through physical therapy that have been paralyzed because of a stroke. Anybody ever watch that? Everything's backwards. They, they, they try to say this and this hand moves. Or they try to move their left leg and the right leg moves. It's, it, the head, the brain is not fully functioning into a part. Until they do physical therapy and learn to walk, learn to move over. They have to train the brain to the muscle to move the action. And the church sometimes, when it's a me church, they have a, a stroke. They're not thinking properly. They're not thinking for Christ. They're thinking for themselves. And they are dysfunctional. And they cannot do what God actually wants them to do. This is my church. Son, let me tell you something. I've been here longer than you will ever be here. What is that? That's the me monster. What about God? What about God moving in certain ways in your life? What about allowing God to say, is that what you want us to do? We can talk about things. We can articulate them. We can even debate them. But if the me monster comes out, that is the flesh. We fail miserably with the flesh. When the part of the body is hurting... Or missing, the body struggles. 
When God brings to the body who he wants in the body, it's not because he wants numbers into the body. You know what God wants for the church? He wants health. He wants a healthy church that's functioning properly in every level. So when God brings you into the body of Christ, he brings you into the church, it's not for your chair. Your chair, whether you're empty or there, the chair's still going to be there. You can come in and set sour and soak all you want. But if you are a functioning part of the body of Christ and you have a gift that God has given to you and you are a member or a visitor or a guest at this church, you have one job. And that job is to function as the body needs. If you are a hand, function as a hand. The feet, function as the feet. Eyes, function as the eyes. God has given to you gifts. No part is better than any other part. If one part is hurting, the entire body hurts, right? You have no control over what part you are. When I am born, I had no control over my body parts. God gave to me what he wanted me to have. I then have to train myself to use my body, my heart, my mind for the cause of Christ. But when one part hurts, they all hurt. Ephesians chapter 2. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are a building together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God has put us together for a purpose. Now, body parts have different purposes. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who worketh in you, both will and to do for his good pleasure. The body is a servant of the head. Jesus is the head. We are the body of Christ. The body should not tell the head what the body is going to do. Military. A private tell a sergeant what to do. What would happen, you military guys? It wouldn't go very well, would it? The head is higher than the body. Jesus is in charge. When Jesus asks you verbally or in scenario or in your spirit, he wants you to do something, you don't have a right to say no. We have been put, we have been adopted into his family, and the family has a responsibility. Um, use my family. Um, I have two boys, and if the house is dirty, and I'm busy, and I say, Brett, I need you to do the dishes. And Brett says, no. Really? No? I'm going to give you another scenario. I am leaving. If the house is not clean when I get home, no, t no food, no car, no insurance, not a jack squat are you going to get from me. Period. If the house is not clean when I get home, he's in trouble, right? How many parents would agree with that? Give me an amen. amen. How many of you would say, go ahead. You don't have to do anything I ask you to do. How many parents agree with that? Not too many, right? That is the purpose of a head telling the body what to do. We do not have the authority to tell the boss what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. The body is not the servant to the head. The head is always in charge. Now, the body's purpose is to glorify Christ. The body's purpose I'm going to give you your purpose. I'm going to give you your purpose in three words. The first word is through worship. He wants to be elevated. The song that we watched, It's All About Me, is not. It's all about him. Now, at this church over the last few years, we've had some issues with our, with our music. We have lost 50 to 75 people in the last four or five years because of music. They don't like the style, too loud, too short, too long, too soft, don't like the singer, don't like the worship pastor, you know, you name it. I've heard it all. And I want to say this with very due respect, and I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I'm going to say it anyway. The worship is not for you. 
when we sing our worship, it's to Christ. If that song is true, it's about you, then the worship is about you. So if it's about you, here's what we ought to do. We ought to come out of your seat during the worship service and stand right here. Sing to me. Because you're singing to me. But if we have the right perspective of worship, it's I don't care because I'm worshiping to the Lord. Amen. Now I understand some of us like hymns and some of us like progressive songs. I understand that. that there's no wrong or right whether it's progressive, whether it's hymns. It's all, it's all perspective. But the right side is if it's our heart, it makes no difference what song we sing as long as it's bring glory and edification to Christ who is our king, who is the head of our church. How we worship the Lord is not out of anger and out of spirit of out of anger because I don't like it. What we should do is bow our faces. So, Lord, do you like it? And if the Lord likes it, I like it. If it brings glory and honor to him and he is having his family and his people worship his name, that's what worship is all about. It's not about me. Here's what worship is. It's through song. It's also through prayer. It's through the reading of the word. It's through the proclaiming of the gospel. It's through his giving. Worship is not songs. Worship is is the condition of the heart. Let me boil this down in a point. It's, it's like the old farmer um, that he's had his field that needs to be plowed after a long winter. And he's getting ready to plow his field and the ground is hard. And he takes that till behind his tractor and he turns that soil over. Turns that soil over. It makes it, it, makes it fresh. It makes it fertile so the seed could be planted in the ground so it could grow. And sometimes when we worship and even before we worship we walk into church because we've had a long week and we've had a lot of stuff take place. We've had a lot of junk go on in our life and our heart is hard. And I get upset and I'm mad. The me monster has taken over six days of my life. And we come into church and Justin and the, and the team they're singing and what worship is supposed to do is to toil, turn our hearts to make it fertile. And if our hearts are not open to the word, we are just bouncing that grain on top of our heart, never to be planted and never to learn. Our worship is opening up our hearts, singing praise to Jesus. So Jesus can take our hearts Turn it. Make it pliable. Make it plantable. So when the word of God is spoken, the Holy Spirit can take the word and put it into your heart and let it grow within your life. It's not just words that we sing. It's the whole aspect of your heart. Worship is this. Jesus and me. I don't care who's on the platform. It makes no difference who's singing. What makes a difference is who we sing to. Are we singing to you? Are we singing to him? Remember the myth? It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Psalm 62, 8. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Psalms 105. Glory in the holy name. Let your heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Let us rejoice in what he can do. So the first purpose is worship. The second purpose is ministry. Ministry. What is the body doing to glorify the head? Listen to that. What are we doing to glorify Christ? Are we a group of individuals that come to church to sit, to learn, to soak it up, to know more, and to come back next week? Or are we the type of church that is worshiping the Lord, that's growing in the Lord, to minister to people out there? 
to people in here? Are we learning for ourselves, the me monster? Or are we learning to grow to do things out there? Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for all. We have to understand ministry is the feat to worship. We like to worship, but we have to minister. But before we can minister, we have to learn how to minister, and that's through discipleship. We have to learn. We have to learn what to do. Not learn for knowledge, but learn for application. Discipleship is not learning the Bible. That's, that's, that's our own. We can open the Bible. We can learn. The application to discipleship is to go out and to do and learn how to. It begins with evangelism. And then goes into teaching. And then it finally goes into ministry. We can't go out to minister unless we learn how. Unless we know what to do. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. And the things that you have heard and among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Discipleship are men and women that have learned how to and are willing to teach others how to. It's they are sacrificing their time to minister to others. I want to leave with this last verse. Incline your heart and your testimony and do not covetousness. Turn away your eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. He said, David is just saying, I don't want to look at anything else. I don't want to do anything else. What I want is I want you to revive me. I want you to give to me a kindled spirit. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to be, if, if I could say this with our kids, I want to be like I am the last night at camp. I, w I want all the power of the Holy Spirit upon me. I've worshipped. I love the music. I've learned the speaking. I've given things over to God. We ought to live our life as the last night at camp every day of our life. Because if we live our life pleasing to God as we did the last night at camp, our heart and our life will be so open to the transparency of God that He can use us he can speak to us. He can move us. He can tell us what to do. And in a whim, we would say, okay, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. The problem with that is we want to, but we get home and the me monster comes out. Oh, that was good while I was at camp. But the me monster takes over and says, nah, not today. How do we control the me monster? is we have to give the me monster to God. Say, Lord, it's not about me. It's about you. Now, your me monster and my me monster, they look totally different. My issue that I hold on to is my issues. And I have to deal with those every day. My job is not to tell you what your me monster is. Your selfishness comes out in different ways than my selfishness comes out. But guess what? We all are selfish. We all have that monster within us that comes out in multiple different ways. But what he has asked us to do is to give our monster, our me monster, to him. So, today, nobody knows what your monster is. But guess who does? It's all about him.